Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Thank you, Scott. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome aboard Must Read Alaska, coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. And we have a great show for you today. I am very, very excited to, um, to talk about this Time Magazine article where the author, who is a big liberal, you know, basically part of the Democratic liberal machine, has, um, has laid out the complete plan for how the Democrats rigged the 2020 election. And you are gonna be stunned. And I know you've heard about this, this article. Um, it's about the secret cabal that manipulated the 2020 election. And they call it the secret history of the shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election. And John Quick is my co-host today. And John, you're there in Nikiski. How is everything in Nikiski today? Oh, everything is amazing in Nikiski, you know. I think our uh, listeners are in for a treat today because everybody who has said for the last six months to a year that the Democrats have, you know, they're going to steal the election, they're going to do something, they're planning, they're plotting, there's, there's, uh, you know, different things they're doing in different states, and then COVID hit, and then, and then everybody thought Donald Trump was going to win. That was a hardcore conservative. Well, it turns out he's not our president anymore. And this lady has painted a picture for us of exactly what has happened. And if, if this article would have been printed, you know, six months ago, it would have been flagged as uh, as uh, as nonsense by Facebook. But now it's praised as a as a uh, uh, trophy of sorts by the left. Oh, absolutely. So it's kind of a brag piece. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, the, the Democrats had to sort of return to the scene of the crime because they are so proud of what they did. And they want everybody to know that it wasn't an accident. I mean, what happened here was very purposeful and it was coordinated. In fact, in this story, they call it a conspiracy. They call it a cabal. They call it a, um, an absolute plan across the richest people in the world, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Jack Dorseys, all the people at Google, all big tech plus big, big government people, deep state people, um, the AFL-CIO, and interestingly enough, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which never really liked Donald Trump anyway because of his um, tariffs against China. So they all cooperated, collaborated with over 100 Democrat surrogate groups, the Democratic Party, and this story lays it all out because they're proud of it and they want people to know this stuff doesn't happen by accident. This stuff happens because we made it happen. We worked hard and we made it happen. They're really proud of it. So it's the secret history of the shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election. And it's in Time Magazine. And you're going to hear a lot of people talking about this. So it's, the story starts out about how a weird thing happened right after the November 3rd election. And you will remember this. Nothing happened. The streets were quiet. The liberal groups had, uh, you know, they had vowed to take the streets if Trump won. They were going to have protests. They were going to burn everything down that, they, that they hadn't burned down already. And so supposedly right wing groups were going to do that too, but nothing happened. And they, this author, Molly Ball, describes why nothing happened. It's because they had normalized the public through many, many channels and through public. Um, through governmental channels as well, that they had fed information to, that they had given sort of cheat sheets to, um, media kits to tell people, after the election, stay calm, we won't know the results for many, many days, many, many days, maybe even weeks. And so by the time the election came around, everybody, no, nobody expected results because they had been told you won't get the results. And people basically stayed calm. And yet you had people like Donald Trump and he was saying, you know, this is really weird because um, within days of the election, the mainstream media, they were already anointing the winner. And Volleyball writes, in a way, Trump was right. 
key states had been hadn't been counted, and yet they were orchestrating a complete plan with the media, according to Molly Ball. And let me tell you, she's a big liberal. She wrote the, the uh, she wrote Nancy Pelosi's biography. She's a big liberal, and she says Trump was right. There was a conspiracy. Now these are her words. There was a conspiracy unfolding behind the scenes, one that both curtailed the protests and coordinated the resistance from CEOs of companies. It's unbelievable what she is writing here. The, the surprises were the result of an informal alliance between left-wing activists and business titans. There you have it there, folks. The richest people in the world didn't like Donald Trump, didn't like his practices, and they coordinated with the, the Chamber of Commerce, AFL-CIO, and everybody stood down on election day. So Trump was saying all, all along that this was going to happen. Remember back in the summer, he was saying this is going to happen. But what she is saying here is the both sides would come to see it as an implicit bargain. Now we're talking about AFL-CIO and the business community. Inspired by the summer's massive, sometimes destructive racial justice protests, well, at least she admits that, in which the forces of labor came together with the forces of capital to keep the peace and oppose Trump's assault on democracy. And yet, she goes on to describe in these 15 pages of this story what actually happened, which was the Democrats' assault on democracy. I mean, they they completely blew up the voting system. And um, so this handshake between labor and business, it's just, they called it a, a big cross-partisan campaign, but essentially what they did is they co-opted moderates and they, they um, paired them with radicals like Black Lives Matter and Color of Change, some of these other groups. And all of the activity was supposedly separate from the Biden campaign, supposedly crossed ideological lines. And even she says there were conservative actors. Well, we know that groups like the Lincoln Project are not conservative. They are absolutely liberal activists, progressive activists. So this is a lie. There aren't conservatives involved. These are leftists. And at least they're just sort of admitting this now. We also know now, John, why would Joe Biden never had to leave his basement? <laughs> it's, the, fix uh, the fix was in. And it's, you know, for those of you listening, it's we have as conservatives have got to step up our game in terms of thinking long term. These folks outplayed, outmaneuvered, outspent, out choreographed, out behind the scenes, puppeteered every aspect of this election and and it, it's uh you know they they spent the millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars with these little side groups that zuckerberg funded and uh you know twitter funded and all these other folks funded to indoctrinate folks to either vote a certain way or to realize that the election was going to take weeks and weeks and weeks to find a winner and you know we as we as conservatives, we look at like the thing that happened with like Liz Cheney got censored like recently. And the average conservative that I know is like, yes, we censored Liz Cheney. We did it. We finally did it. And the Democrats are like, uh, we have the, the next 17 presidential elections planned out and how to win <laughs> each one by state, by county, by city. Uh, you guys can just focus in on this stuff that doesn't really matter. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, worry about wearing a mask and worry about censoring Lisa Murkowski and great, you know, great. Let's censor some folks, you know, for not being Republicans. Meanwhile, the other team has literally put a playbook together on how to beat us in every facet of every opportunity in every election, including the presidential election. And, we may want to get off our butts and do something about it. Yeah, so you nailed it right there. This is the she describes it as, as this way: the scenario that the shadow campaigners were desperate to stop was not just a Trump victory. These are her words. It was an election so calamitous that no result could be discerned at all—a failure of the central act of democratic self-governance. 
So basically what they, they wanted to do I think, is touch every aspect of the election. Now here's what Molly Ball writes. They got states to change voting systems and laws and they got hundreds of million dollars secured in public and private funding. Listen to that. They they got states to change their laws. It's it's remarkable. So they got people like Mark Zuckerberg and, and Jack Dorsey involved, and uh, they got all this money that they had, and they started actually making grants to local counties and to states so that they could get more PPE, more personal protective equipment, and, um, and have that available at the voting booths and so forth. And then because they had made these grants, they were able to sort of insinuate themselves into the actual structure of, of government, into the structure of the divisions of elections and start working with the divisions and, and changing the laws behind the scenes. And meanwhile, the Republicans were out there with the normal playbook and they were just you know running the get out the vote campaign and they were working the electoral map. These guys, they absolutely didn't need the Dominion voting machines to be changed. They just needed to know that the vote wouldn't be finalized until every single vote that they could find was brought in. And so this is, we, we, we gotta understand that this was played out not just around the country in the battleground states, but actually here in Alaska with Alaskans for Better Elections now, um, they, you know, they, they've changed our voting system. We're going to go into ranked choice voting. They spent six to seven million dollars to convince Alaskans to change the voting system. And, and they did. The Alaskans voted for it. And it's pretty disturbing that, that we fell for it, right? But now they have a lot of money left over over there. And they've taken $150,000 of that money that they have left over. And they bought lobbyists. And so Alaskans for Better Elections bought these lobbyists to now continue to fundamentally change our elections forever so that it's not just mail-in ballots that don't need a signature witness on that. For COVID years, if it's good enough for a COVID year, it's good enough for any year. And so in the future, that's what they'll be fighting for is um, absolutely no signature verification. And that's what you saw all over the country. And in fact, this article in Time Magazine, which is, profound, it should be required reading by everybody. It's called The Secret History of the Shadow Campaign That Saved the 2020 Election. And we know that they, when they mean saved the 2020 election, saved it for Joe Biden and them and, and the Democrats. And I wonder, John, are we? can we do something where we can post this up on our Facebook page so people can easily find it? We can. We can uh, post it up there and we'll pin it to the top for a day or so just so folks can um, find it. And, you know, I'm hopeful that the honeymoon phase of Joe Biden will end very quickly and that some of these uh, very wealthy folks will soon realize that a lot of their wealth is about to go into funding programs and pet projects that they may not even like and their tax brackets are going to go up and they're in and they're this stuff that they are going to owe to the government is going to become more and more and more. And I think that every time that you know, we get a, you know, you get a George Bush in there and then the pendulum swings to a Clinton and then you get a Clinton in there and the pendulum swings to a Bush again. And then you get an Obama and then you get a Trump. I hope that the fear of the unknown gets conservatives off their, off their keisters to get involved into winning the next presidential election. Because oftentimes when you're sit, sitting in your uh, basement playing video games, all fat and happy with Donald Trump as your president and you're a conservative, you don't really do much to keep it going. You only get off your butt when you're uh, uh, not too happy about what's currently going on. And uh, so I hope that this puts a little fire under people's bellies to get out there and do something about it. And when I say do something about it, I mean, volunteer, uh, get involved with local politics, get yourself on an advisory board in your borough, get yourself on an advisory board in your uh, city. Uh, don't do anything crazy, it means get involved. And I think mm -hmm. that's where some of the, the pavement and the road is missed is that when conservatives say, get off your keister and do something about it, we're not saying get off your keister and go be crazy. We're saying get involved like a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I wanna make sure that we differentiate there on what the heck that means. 
For sure. Well, so uh, to, to continue on this story, they talk, uh, this, this author, Molly Ball in uh, Time Magazine, she actually writes this. Now, this is a, another direct quote. They successfully pressured social media companies to take a harder line against disinformation, and they use data-driven strategies to fight viral smears. That is just stunning because we saw so much coming from the left and we saw so much coordination on social media on the left for the riots and for, for the things that they were doing. And but they, they are basically saying here, they successfully pressured the social media companies to shut down conservatives. And in fact, in this article, she talks about how these groups, all these big liberal groups, they got together and they met with they had dinner with Mark Zuckerberg. They had dinner with Jack Dorsey. And they convinced them to join in their plan to basically take over the White House with Biden. This, is a, this was a huge takeover. So then she goes on to say, they executed national public awareness campaigns that helped Americans understand how the vote count would unfold over days or weeks, preventing Trump's conspiracy theories and false claims of victory from getting more traction. So here's what they were doing. They're just normalizing it making it comfortable, you know, that vote's not going to be known right away. And so you remember how this normalizing actually took place last October. That's exactly what you saw. And so we look back and we, we could see that they were grooming all of us on Facebook, on Twitter and Google. It was just a big grooming operation to calm down and don't worry because we've, we've got this. And again, that's why Biden didn't have to leave his basement. I want to and talk about about one other thing, but go ahead, make your point. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, uh, hope is not lost. I think that uh, some of this stuff will hopefully, um, I, I think some people are going to be get in trouble for some of this stuff. You can't, um, you know, if, if this were to happen 10, 15 years ago and somebody, if a group of people conspired to uh, actively uh influence all news that came out of NBC, ABC, CBS, and were effective at controlling all the news. And, and, you know, that you couldn't do that back then. I mean, some would argue that it's, you know, the left and they're going to be in bed with whoever they want, but um, this stuff is unprecedented and, and it's being almost ignored because it's Facebook and it's Twitter and, oh, these are just social media. Well, this is the media that people consume. People are on their phones 10 hours a day, looking at Facebook, looking at Twitter. It's what they read. It's what they take as the news. And these people figure out a way to, to uh, control every aspect of that. And mm -hmm. I hope that some judge along the way finds this as being illegal, but yeah. who knows? Okay, so they're not, that's not going to happen. So we'll move on. And the, one of the, one of the uh, programs that they put together in this was called a voter protection program. And, and, and again, if, if you're just tuning in, we're talking about a story in Time Magazine about that where the, the, the Democrats basically spill the beans on what their plan was. And they, they had a shadow campaign that none of us knew about. We could see the aspects of it, but we had no idea the incredible depth to which they were coordinating um, their efforts but they had this one part of the program called the Voter Protection Program. And it was essentially remaking the entire election system throughout the different states. And I was stunned when I looked into who the Voter Protection Program was. It is a, a bunch of um, former attorneys general from around the country that are all Democrats. And one of them is our own former Attorney General, Jana Lindemuth who we all know uh, worked for uh, Governor Bill Walker when he was uh, governor of Alaska, and who also is one of the, was the, one of the lead lit litigants to push the recall Dunleavy Committee forward. And she is a lawyer and colleague of Scott Kendall, who was part of the Alaskan for Better Elections and the prime moving force behind the recall Dunleavy group. So Jana Lindemuth is on this voter protection project. Well, now, now it starts falling into place. What they're trying to do is all over the country change the laws so that, uh, so that as they put it, um, you know, spoil that we they didn't want Trump to spoil the election. And those are their words, spoil the election. In other words, didn't want him to win because that would be spoiling their election. And uh, and they kept 
uh, insisting that he was saying that things were rigged. Well, yeah, you're giving us evidence. And they, they talk about his henchmen at the local level. He says his henchmen at the state um, at the state sought to bring uh, to block their use of, um, of of these mail-in ballots, while his lawyers brought dozens of spurious claims, lawsuits to make it more difficult to vote. And it, listen to how, how they describe Republicans that who are all volunteers. They describe them as henchmen at the state level. And I know these people. They're not henchmen. They're just working class people like you and me. They're volunteers, and they certainly weren't doing anything spurious. And they, all they were trying to do is ensure that we had a legitimate election with, with let's just make sure that all our mail-in ballots are legitimate because we see what's happening. And it says uh, here, Molly Ball writes, before the election, Trump plotted to block a legitimate vote count. Oh, he did no such thing. This is just an absolute lie. This is one of the myths. These guys, they launched all these lawsuits time and again to ba basically steal the election and they're accusing Trump of actually trying to steal it. So, you know, basically everybody, Time has written this story claiming that they claim that a secret cabal banded together to stop Donald Trump from winning. And they did everything, they manipulated the media, they got the election laws changed and it's the inside story of the conspiracy to save the 2020 election. Uh, it's like you said, John, if they had written this before the election, Twitter would have banned them for misinformation. Uh, Facebook would have blocked it or at least put a note on it saying this information has been disputed. But since they're writing it after, they're do after the election, they're basically doing a victory lap. And it's just, um, it's pretty stunning. The whole thing is pretty darn stunning. Everybody's got to read this story and um, it's going to tell you a lot about what just happened. And I wanted to mention this one group called the Fight Back Table. They have, have, who's ever heard of this Fight Back Table? We weren't paying attention. The Democrats have this thing. It's a big coalition of what they call resistance organizations. And they're all the, the usual suspects, right? And they were meeting regularly and they're still meeting regularly. And I started looking into it. Who is the fight back group? Well, they were able to have, with a flip of a text, they could just, they could mobilize a, a mob, they could mobilize a protest, or they could mobilize a riot, or they could have people stand down by just sending a text out saying, stand down, we're not going to protest. So they had great control over um, these different um, groups around the country that were like change, move on, um, the Na National Domestic Workers Alliance, People's Action. Um, color, color of Change, and then this group called Demos. And I looked into it, it's like, who are these people called Demos? Well, George Soros, that's, that's the, the president comes from the George Soros Open Society Foundation. So we got played, uh, those of us who are conservatives, they changed the rules of voting. They made everybody afraid to vote in person and they succeeded. But at the end of the day, like 50% of the voters voted by mail. And you know, I'm telling you, John, this isn't just the playbook they had for this election. They're studying it. They're learning from it. They did it. It worked so well. This is the playbook for all future elections. This is what we're up against. It's sad because, uh, you know, they, uh, the, there's so much hypocrisy happening. It's just ridiculous. I mean, um, just the simple fact that folks like Pelosi and other politicians for the last 12 months have all have encouraged people to protest in cities where the protests ends up burning down those cities and burning down the businesses, most of which were my, minority owned businesses and applauded by the left for people for standing up and all this stuff. All this was orchestrated people. It's literally laid out in this thing. They text this group that you just mentioned, and they go and they send out a bunch of people to go picket and riot, and it's funded by Soros. And it's this playbook is literally written on time.com. You can go to it. It's not some secret conspiracy, bright part, you know, early access, only have, you know, you gotta have a username and a password. No, this is on a time magazine website that the left considers their website. Yep, and they're yep. bragging about it. Absolutely. And, uh, it's very sad. And so you remember um, how, you know, after the election, uh, 
Trump was going to have all these lawsuits and they said they're going to bring out the Kraken and they were going to show that it was all a big plot. Well, they were right. They just couldn't get, they just couldn't kind of figure it out soon enough. And they, they were chasing down things like uh, Dominion voting the, you know, problems, which that was the problem. It wasn't ever the machines. It was, let's go change the laws so that we can get mail-in ballots and then let's go get a bunch of mail-in ballots. We saw that happen in Alaska. And if you, um, if you want to see how that worked, look what happened in Anchorage. You know, Trump won Anchorage in, 20, uh, in 2016, but in 20, uh, 2020, oh my gosh, uh, Biden won by uh, over 16% margin. And so where did that come from? That came from ballot harvesting and that came from the big uh, effort to say, no, you know, no signature, no signature needed. So they, they sent all these people to Alaska and they just harvested the heck out of Anchorage because Anchorage is pretty easy. You don't know, door to door. You just go through the apartment buildings and the condos and stuff. And you just ask people, look, at, you don't want to go vote. And, and let me tell you, I had friends who this happened to. Person would come to the door and say, you really don't want to go vote on election day. It is not safe. Just give me your ballot. I'll, I'll take it. I'll mail it for you. And they persuaded um, a lot of people just to give them their ballots that they would mail them for them. So uh, across, across the country, we don't know exactly what happened and whether or not they found some extra ballots to stuff in boxes could have happened, but they for sure changed the law. They for sure did vote, you know, ballot harvesting. And this was all coordinated with big tech, the richest people in the world, big unions, dark money. They interfered with the elections. We don't need, need no stinking <laughs> Russians to interfere with our elections when we have the Democrats. But this is really opposite of democracy. This secret cabal of wealthy and politically connected elites. This is the opposite. This is billions of dollars, untraceable, being spent by surrogate groups, and they manipulated the laws and they changed the elections. And at the end of the day, they had to ban Trump from Facebook and Twitter because Trump has the praise of the people. He, mm -hmm. he, he may not do the correct things, as a policymaker, he may not do the correct things as the president. He may not be politically correct, but people love Trump and they knew that they had to shut him up. And the only way to do that was to kick his podium from underneath him. And, uh, you know, he's going to have to figure out a way, new way to talk to people. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And then he may, he may come out with something. But, well, so it's a great story because it basically they're bragging about it. I don't know if they they understand that we read it differently than they read it. They read it and they and they do a victory lap, think that they did a really good job. We read it and we and we see the words cabal, secret, uh, conspiracy, dark money, all of this stuff that we consider to be probably pretty bad. But anyway, I want you to check it out. And John's going to post this on our Facebook page because um, it's worth reading. And we're discussing with your family. Do forward it to your family and friends. A lot of people have forwarded it to me. I really appreciate people flagging me on this. I, I couldn't believe it when I read it. I think I've read it three, four times now. So, um, John, before we go, what else do we need to remind uh, listeners about? Uh, Wednesday podcast? So we got a Wednesday podcast. Scott is uh, on the Wednesday podcast. He is bringing the heat every Wednesday-ish to the Must Read Alaska podcast. We got a Must Read Alaska app that everybody needs on their iPhone or Android phone. If you go to your iTunes store or Google Play store, you can download our app for free. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a service and a gift we want to give to you. Um, if you like it, we ask that you give us a review. And, uh, you know, you can catch us on MeWe and you can catch us on Caucus Room. And uh, we're on the usual Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, LinkedIn, you name it, we're on it. Once, and, once upon a uh, time, we were on Parlor, but we're not on Parlor yeah. anymore, are we? Nobody's on Parlor. <laughs> not anymore. And, and if anybody who's interested in, in, in getting uh, the newsletter, of course, you go to mustreadalaska.com and sign up on the right-hand side for the newsletter. Just click on the, that newsletter thing and sign up. And we also have a daily legislative bulletin that's coming out during the legislature. And it's really good. We're getting good reviews off of it and I hope you, hope you like it. It's called the M uh, Club MRAC. And uh, we're just trying to keep everybody up with just exclusively legislative news. So uh, with that, I just love working with you, John. I love working with you too, Scott. You're both doing a great job for Must Read Alaska. If you're a supporter of this uh, project, this conservative new news project in Alaska, 
Thank you so much. It makes all of this possible, it makes it possible for us to stand up for what's right in Alaska and to, to speak about it publicly. If you'd like to support the conservative side of the news, the donate button is on the right side at mustreadalaska.com and your support allows this project to stay strong, independent, thoughtful, and against the big blue wave of the activist liberal media and they know who they are. So until next week, we're signing off here from somewhere in Alaska.